Does everybody have it in them for one more? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I don't want to give it all away here yet. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much um, for having me here. Um, you know, and hearing that introduction, you know, and hearing the year 2008 and realizing, um, you know, when, when that 306090 came out, um, walking through walls, is that I'm still working on the same project, capital P. Um, these are still things I'm working on now, I'm trying to um, always kind of play through. Um, so what, what, I, what I thought I would do uh, tonight in, in terms of this idea of, of no president is instead of uh, focusing on uh, the design work per se, which I think is, you know, there's a, there's a chunk of it within the gallery space, is to talk a little bit more about the kind of idea behind um, the generator or the, the kind of larger um, objective behind the design work itself. So instead of maybe walking through um, the design projects, in, which range the scale from everything from kind of large scale museum uh, projects uh, to smaller scale installation pieces, um, what those can be seen uh, either through the gallery, um, through the website. Um, what I'll talk a little bit more about today specifically is uh, what these ideas are coming from. Because in a way, for me, what I find most important uh, maybe as an architect or in terms of uh, maybe just the contribution of what I find interesting is that these are the way in which I execute these, this idea, but the idea behind it, I think, um, is, is open enough for, for a lot of people to kind of enter into. Um, so if I was going to make an, uh, an analogy between the architect, uh, I would say that an architect to me is a lot like um, an explorer. Uh, the difference being that an explorer, we think of an explorer today, whether they're going through to the ocean depths, whether they're going to space, whether they're going to um, land in territory that we've never been to before, um, they're always kind of seeking out a new territory. And what I, I would say with, with the architect, the only difference is that an architect, instead of having to go a great distance to do that, the architect's ambition is to stand still and push that environment forward to a point where it hasn't been before. So instead of seeking to travel great distances, the architect essentially stands still and pushes that territory, that environment, um, into the future to make it something that it wasn't there before. So for me, you know, that's how I see the role of the architect. Um, and as someone who, you know, I may describe myself as an architect, but trained in practicing landscape architecture as well as architecture, for me, the kind of the link between the two is, is really it's not so much um, architecture per se, but everything that you know it, it encapsulates as a whole. And to do that, um, the primary motive for that is the materiality in which we work with. So, through a, a range of materiality, we actually change <laughs> spatial organization. Because if you pick a material, think about a material, think about the lineage of that material. That materiality is never neutral. It's never just a translation of one thing into another thing. It always has a repercussion. It changes how you um, separate two activities, um, the span of those activities. So whether we think about uh, glass, transparency, the idea of being able to connect outside to inside and what that does to act those, those programs, those activities, whether we think about the advent of, of iron and uh, steel, uh, the fact that you have these, you know, thinking about two um, 17th century um, <coughs> train stations to actually be able to have these large span interiors to accommodate a new program of, of, of transnational transportation, um, thinking about a uh, stacked uh, program of the tower typology, where they think about concrete, reinforced concrete, and the malleability of that materiality. The point though is that each one of these is linked not only just to a change of a boundary, but it has repercussions as to how that activity changed because of that boundary. So the question at hand for me is, what materiality are we not giving enough attention to in a way? And for me, that what well, I find the greatest opportunity is the idea of energy. And as a whole, if we think about energy within architecture, it falls within two camps. It's either 
if, if, you were, if someone was going to say, you, okay, identify energy to me in this room right now, most people would either point to uh, the mechanical systems, you would point to the light source. Um, if you're talking about technology as an advancement, you would talk about photovoltaic cells, wind, wind powered. It's usually a, a technology you point to as a representation of the material, not the materiality itself. So the question is, how can we actually think about energy as a building block material, something that has um, um, a material that we can control and work with and actually give it a level of responsibility that we can actually design with as a materiality. So this idea of energy actually, and I'm going to get to it in a little bit more detail, has a, has a kind of interesting correlation to that of some of our ambitions that we have with geometry and surface, which is our primary mode of working as an architect. So if you were just to say, look at the idea of plasticity in architecture, as an example, um, Borromini's Quattro Fontana, this idea of creating the sculptural quality of, of surfaces to kind of create this ability of a plasticity. At the same time that we have this interest in working with something that's, you know, it's again, it's the solid state construction, it's, it's the stone, but it's a, it's, a, it's a wish to push it to do something that it couldn't or shouldn't naturally do. And at the same time we're thinking about that plasticity, the word gas is used for the first time almost to the year. So, um, Jan um, Baptist Van Helmut uses the word gas for the first time to define a state of matter that's not solid and it's not liquid. At the same time, we talk about lightness. So, um, Bernini's um, work with uh, Ecstasy of St. Teresa, <coughs> which is a combination of, of stone, it's, it's the natural light, it's painting, it's a hidden light source back in here that brings light from the outside and shines into this piece. So it's this idea of working again with this range of materiality, but it's always through another mechanism. It's through the painting, it's through the stone, but it's an intention of lightness itself. And again, around the same time period, you have this idea of atmosphere actually having weight. So there's this theory that atmosphere has weight by carrying a barometer to the top of a mountain to show that atmospheric pressure decreases with height. So this moment in which you start to realize that atmosphere itself actually is a materiality that actually has weight to it. And as we start moving even into the advent of, of iron and, and glass, this idea of creating these artificial climates, being able to go to distant lands, grab vegetation, um, and actually bring that vegetation back into England, back into Europe, and create an environment that allows that vegetation to grow. So nearly seven years prior to cast iron and glass frame public buildings, exhibition structures that would emerge in England and France to reproduce exotic climates, um, Carl Scheel is synthesizing, architect, um, synthesizing oxygen for the first time. So it's this kind of correlation between the will of architecture through the materiality that we have access to, generally, you know, solid construction lines, surfaces. We have these wills and we have these intentions. But at the same time within the sciences, there's an advancement of trying to understand what energy, what kind of qualities can actually be harnessed and used. The question is, we just haven't been able to kind of um, bring those two together quite yet. So, pushing this thing forward, you have, and of course, usually it's within um, warfare, um, the military, that, that these advancements uh, make their way through. But Peter Slaughterdyke talks about um, the advent of, of, of chemical warfare during World War I. Um, and and what he, what, what's really interesting about it is that this is the first time in World War I where the attack isn't so much about a projectile, a missile, a bullet, um, a hammer, something that's thrown or, or projectile at a body and trying to do harm to the body. It's actually a production in which you actually poison the environment and that, that kills off the, 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 the individual. So you're actually targeting the environment over the human body. And what's kind of most interesting about this is that the use of... of, um, of um, of chlorine gas at this point in time, is that it actually starts to have a real physical boundary to it. And when you deploy it, it has a center, it has an outside, and it has a point where you're not in it. And as that wind changes, that boundary shifts and grows. But it's a true physical entity that the body has to be aware of. But what's really interesting at the same time is this advent of the gas mask. So the gas mask comes about so that the body can mediate the respiratory system 
from that chemical condition. And this for me is, is this relationship, the fact that architecture's primary motive is a lot like this gas mask in the sense that it's primarily an act of mediation. So whether we're talking about the advent of air conditioning, um, dehumidification, a way in which you can actually create an environment on the interior that can, can be controlled all year round. This is done primarily in factories in which you would seal the room up so that you would, you would allow no, no external sources to be linked <coughs> to the outside. And you could then control that climate. And it would allow for um, fabrication um, textiles to actually, whether you want to have it in Georgia or you want to have it in, in, um, in um, Chicago, you can have that activity. Or whether you're talking about something even more contemporary in which you have these, the glass boundary. The, the point, though, is that whether it's transparent or whether it's sealed and massive, it's always this line, this demarcation point that separates one thing from the other thing, whether it's the overhang, whether it's the glass. It's this act of drawing a line and choosing what gets in, what gets bounced back, and what gets absorbed. And for me, that's, that is something that architecture um, does as a primary mechanism for controlling. And it's, it's that line that we use to design. All our value of architecture goes into that line, right? So whether it's the shape we give architecture that we identify, whether it's the, the kind of monetary value we give it, and whether it's the this kind of spatial boundaries that this person has to this space versus that space, it's all done through a line. So what interests me as, a, as, a, as an approach to this is to question something that is so fundamental within the field and see what the other alternatives are. So if we don't think about as architecture as an act of mediation from the environment, the context, the climate around it, but actually architecture as the designing of an active context. So instead of thinking about all the energy that we let in through breezes, the light that we reflect, heat that we, we garnish and include and hold within the architecture, what if we actually work with those energy systems and amplified them and actually thought of them, them as the architecture itself? So architecture doesn't become about a mediation device, this pink line, it's actually the energies themselves. And what does that do then for architecture? What, what are the ramifications of an architecture in which it's controlled by an active context? So to kind of give you an analogy about this, um, if everyone was to kind of think back to um, the, uh, the Beijing Olympics, particularly in architecture, and you think back upon it, most everybody has an image of the facades, right? So we look back, whether it's the, the, um, the aquatic center, whether it's the bird nest, these are kind of these emblematic images of, of activities. Um, and as we know, if we start thinking back to it, um, one of the big issues they had was actually um, the climate of the time, the smog, the air quality for the athletes as they moved through this. This is something that they, they needed to control. Um, and again, so if we're looking at, this is the, the water cube um, with the kind of emblematic, kind of looks like, you know, water bubbles as a facade. And this here is the pool itself under construction. So this is, and then these, you know, Michael Phelps um, swimming and breaking his records. So this is also a time where it was really interesting hearing a broadcaster talk about the pool. And, th and what the question that kind of came up was, within the field of, of, of sports, there's always a pressure to go forward faster and faster and faster. Break new records, get new sponsors. That, that's, the, that's the approach, right? And we even saw this within the bathing suits, right? So there were examples of, of people who had these complete body suits, who had the advantage of one person versus another person, um, who had access to technology that the other person didn't have. Um, I think it was something like, within this one Olympics, 30, um, 25 um, times world records were beaten. And then within one race, the first four people who passed the finish line had already had all beaten the world record prior to that. So the first four people all beat the world record prior to the beginning of the race. Um, so you had this question of um, the advent of, the, of the, the suits, but you also had a question of the pool itself. So with the, the pool, there was this idea of creating um, a way of decreasing the body's movement through the, through the area, right? So the idea is for this body to move through that water as quickly as it can. 
And there are a lot of techniques within the geometry of that pool. There is a depth that's, that's thought to be ideal so that no body movement, all the wake, doesn't get bounced back up and interfere with the body moving through it. There are um, lanes at the end of the pool where that water can dissipate and drain out and not bounce back. Um, there's a whole series of techniques. But one of these announcers came up with the point that, as far as he was concerned, the pools had gotten as fast as they were going to get. Um, they had engineered them as highly as they could with the geometry services to make these pools go as quickly as they can. If the pools were going to get any faster, it wasn't going to become through a sense of kind of mediating that, that water. It was actually going to be by chemically changing and altering the water system itself. If you want to go faster, it's not going to come from designing the pool. It's going to come from designing the water itself. So for me, this becomes a kind of, kind of window into the fact that it's about what we move through, not the system or the infrastructure we set up itself. So this, for me, becomes a kind of great moment in which you're talking now about an active context as opposed to a designing an architecture of mediation. So if you think about architecture as this, these kind of air bubbles in a pool of water, meaning you, they are distinct, they are separate, they, they kind of... They, they, they exist within here as kind of little moments um, with the context of the water moving around them um, as essentially air bubbles. The question is, can we start thinking about the properties of these energies? And for, I'll get into these you know, in more detail in a second, but these are you know, everything from thermodynamics to um, electromagnetic to the chemical. Like how do we actually start working with these materials and start amplifying them so that we can actually start taking on the roles and responsibilities that we need to give architecture, meaning the room that we're in right now, the ability to cast light, the ability to have seating, the ability to um, separate this room from an audience that's outside milling around having wine. Um, like how, do you, how do you do that? And the question is that, you know, can we go from an idea of thinking of architecture as these air bubbles to, an act, to actually working with an active context itself? And this isn't something that we don't do now. And this is the thing. This, the, the fact is, we, we dump a lot of energy right now. We change our environment. We just don't do it as a conscious move. So whether it's a building that casts shadows, whether it's buildings that have reflections that reflect off into the area, whether it's an infrastructure, that heat right outside, that in the winter will release energy, excess energy from this building or from the, the infrastructure of the subway into the grates and into the city. Whether it's urban heat islands, that all the macadam and concrete we have that actually changes the temperature of a city like Atlanta or Houston from its environment because of all the heat captured from, that, from, that, from the sun, or whether it's just energy dumps from mechanical systems that vent out into it. So the point is, we do this with energy all the time. We just do it as a byproduct. We don't actually take it as, as a design material that we can work with and, and start to harness. So a kind of another analogy to help to kind of push this forward would be to say, if we were to look at St. Peter's in Rome, Michelangelo, or um, um, Villa Sawa by Corb. You know, these, when, when we work with materialities around us, when we work with, we don't reproduce essentially um, the geological caves around us, right? We, when we work with stone, um, steel, iron, or lime, you know, we, we create these things, we take the components that exist around us, and we reconformulate them, we amplify them, we merge them together to give us reinforced concrete, to give us um, steel. And by doing this, we then create an architecture that is not a reproduction of the geological caves and sites we have around us. We create it, we create an art form that's something unique. But when it comes to atmospheric variables, we don't do that we generally try to create ideal, recognizable climates. So right now, we're in a room that is considered to be an ideal comfort zone. We don't actually think about those materialities as amplifying them in the same way we do geological things to create an architecture. We think of them only as a way of harnessing them to do something we already know them capable of doing. We don't have that kind of imagination with them as a materiality to push them. So to kind of give a quick idea of what these these material energies are. Um, you know, they, they exist in, in some real kind of basic uh, levels. So on the one hand, you have this idea of these auras. Uh, these are basically what Kipnis would call the cosmetic, right? So 
These are moods, effects, atmospheres. These are things that essentially, um, whether you're looking back at uh, Bernini or whether you're looking at um, Herzog and Demeron, they are essentially things that require a surface. They, they don't do anything in terms of architectural responsibility. They require the surface for their glows, for their effects, for their moods, for their qualities. Um, but they don't take on any kind of architectural responsibility themselves. The other side, of the flip side of that, would be to think about something like this, where we have our engineered sweet spot of what we consider comfortable. So we take all those same energies, same exact qual materialities of humidity, of, of light, of um, temperature, and we find an ideal condition to create that kind of 72 degree, 50% relative humidity of San Diego and reproduce it in Boston. Like, that's what we think about. So we're either creating this comfort control through the interior of a box that we created. So again, geometry defines this space, and then we fill it with a climate control to meet our needs, or we think of it as something that's sort of bouncing on the outside of the building. But it doesn't ever really necessarily get picked up to become a materiality that architects can work with. So one of the most basic examples of what I would say would be a materiality would be street lighting. So what street lighting does is through the advent of creating a street-like condition, you have a, 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 you have a physical boundary that gives you a series of properties. It gives you safety. It gives you the ability to have recreation or commerce throughout the course of the evening. It gives you a series of, of, um, of boundaries that allow activities to occur. It's also not a reproduction of the sun, right? So when you think about the night system here, whether you're here within the city or whether you're out in a kind of rural area, is that essentially you're not reproducing the sun. There's billions and billions of point lights that then create these typologies, whether it's a series of distinct nodes going down a road or whether it's a continuous system. When you're in that light, you have the security, you have the ability to have recreation, you have the ability to have commerce in the city. When you're outside that light, when you're outside that physical boundary, you're essentially out of that loop, you're out of that responsibility. And it's all because of the physical boundary that comes from the gradient of that light. So, to think about that, this is just an example of how, like, when we think about a material energy, whether it be chemical, electromagnetic, thermal, sound, that, this is when it becomes an actual building block material, something that architects can work with and design with. And as you move out beyond that, you start getting into the comfort controls um, and auras that kind of move beyond it. So, in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way, the idea is to kind of take Eve Klein's fire column um, that he created and start thinking about, can we start looking at, at energy as a, as a kind of another order of architecture, the way we would have the Doric, the Ionic, Corinthian. Like, this actually becomes a materiality um, that architects could then, you know, think about and work with as a materiality. So, the, the kind of underlying current of all of this that, I, that I'm trying to get to is that it's not just a swapping of one materiality for the other. It's not the idea that you work with um, a gradient versus the line, but, but this is the kind of just a quick example here is this would be, say, a Palladian, um, a Palladian villa versus the advent of corridors. When, when you have the necklace circulation, each, each one of these two is actually drawn with lines and surfaces. So it's, it's, it's very difficult in a way as an architect to realize how ingrained this technique is in what we do daily. So whether you work with a pen and a notepad, whether you work in Rhino, whether you work in Illustrator, you're essentially sketching a geometry. You're sketching a line. It's an abstraction for a wall, a ceiling, and that organizes all the activities and programs that we work with daily. And those have repercussions. They're not neutral, again. so. Whether you want to talk about the Palladian Villa, and this red being the circulation, the idea is that you go from one room to the next room to the next room, and you interrupt the activity of each of those rooms. With the advent of a corridor, this is something that Robin Evans talks about, it changes the activity. You, know, you now go from a destination, which each one of these rooms doesn't require you to pass through them. You actually can just kind of skirt right through them, right past them, through the advent of the corridor. And these, these, are, these are kind of coincide both with techniques that architects use and deploy, as well as kind of social ramifications of the time that are, that are occurring. But the question that's on the table, it's an open-ended question, is 
if we go from lines and surfaces that are primary mechanism of, of designing space, organizing space, to that of gradients, because the, the property of an, of an energy is that you can't draw energy as a line. You can only draw it as a gradient. And for me, this is a critical shift in thinking about how we organize space, going from, from, from lines to, uh, to that of surfaces. And I wasn't, the point wasn't to necessarily show this, but since, um, since Jimenez had a duck, I'll show you a duck. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how this correlates to, to Jimenez's, but, uh, you know, if we spend enough time together, then I'm sure it does. Um, <laughs> um, the point being is, if you, this is the two, two ideas here. Is one is a stacked duck versus the stuffed pig. And for me, when you start thinking about um, program activities, the two ways you can go about it that we generally think about it is, is either... You define an activity, you say this is going to be the conference room, this is going to be the bedroom, this is going to be the mechanical room, this is going to be uh, the lecture room, and you find a way of stacking them together to give yourself a larger form. And you construct a stacked duck. Or, you work with a surface, and you create a shape of an outline that's desired, and then you cut it up like a piece of meat, and you assign activities to that meat. The point is, like, the, these are things that are so intrinsic in the way we work that if we start thinking about material energies themselves, how does this then um, play out? And I'm going to, you know, we're short on time here, so I'm going to do this kind of rather quickly. But the kind of, one of the other aspects of this that, that's really important is, is the human body and how we think about the body. Um, so for so long, we think about the Vitruvian man, we think about the modular man, of course. So much of this is about proportion. And this has a lot to do with lines and surfaces. When you, when you think about the body here, it's all about proportion of one part of the body to the other. How this finger is related to an arm, to a head, um, to the whole, the whole body itself. But it's essentially the surface of the human body, proportionally how it relates to the surface of the wall. So my relationship right now is based on my relationship to this wall, to that wall, to you, to this. It's ergonomics, it's surfaces that we design with, with surfaces of the body. The question is, we're getting to a point now where our sensory perception is increasing beyond anything that's ever happened prior to this. So even within our own lifetimes, or in our parents' or grandparents' lifetimes, we've gone from the ability to understand a norm of the body, and if you were born or developed over time a deficiency of that, you could then be brought back up to considered norm. So if, you're, if you lost your hearing, you could, get a, you could get a hearing aid, or you could wear glasses. And eventually over time, you could see or hear somewhat similar to the way someone else may have when they were born with a so-called um, normal condition. We're at the point now, as we all know through LASIK, through contacts, that you can actually see equally as well as someone who, who is considered within a normal condition. The question is, the next time you go in for an appointment for LASIK surgery, when you go in for for hearing or anything else, chemical, mood, um, um, depression, will we choose to only go to the represented normal or will we go beyond that? So right now, if you're going into the military and you have to go to get deployed, <coughs> the question isn't whether or not they'll give you 20-20 vision, the question is the military will give you better vision today than you were born with, than you could have been born with. And we're getting to that threshold now where our bodies can perceive and work in relationship to space that is unlike any time before. And for me, this has a direct co um, correlation to the gradient. There's a sense that how do we perceive that? And that perception is that we go from, from this idea of proportions of skin and body to actually something that's more of a sensorial envelope, meaning how do we detect difference? Because if you can detect difference, you can detect a boundary. And if you can detect the boundary, that's architecture. At the end of the day, that's, that's how I consider it. So we start melding together this idea of an active context, which we talked about with the material energies, with the ability of a sensorial envelope. You start to meld these two together as a kind of symbiosis of a relationship of what produces architecture. So I know I'm running short on time here, so I'll just, this is the last two slides. These are just a couple things that are kind of key back over and over as kind of strategies that come through the work and over and over. So you think about, first one, 
Rather than continue to focus on maximizing efficiency for the conservation and consumption of energy, future research will explore an architecture potential of energy as a building block material to carry loads, define spatial hierarchies and circulation, provide security, and create an aesthetic malleability. Architecture will transcend its predominant method of constructing physical boundaries with solid state elements and instead define space with the gradient boundaries inherent in energy. The result will be an architecture of intensities unique to its spatial and organizational implications. Chemical performance enhancers, implants, surgeries have artificially altered the human's body's physiology and sensory perception. These alternatives permit us to perceive a range of material energies and potential systems of organization that were previously imperceptible. At the intersection of these two seemingly distinct areas of research, increased sensory sensitivity and an architect's control over a new range of material energies lies the potential for a new architecture. And finally, the implication of these developments for a design profession are vast. By overcoming its continually splintering subsets of specializations, now an integrated field of architecture, landscape architecture, engineering, urban design, engage more directive, more broad directives through a shared materiality of energy, which we know from the outside of the environment and landscape, and we know from the interior of the environment that's here right now. Boom, done, thank you. <laughs>